We're going to go ahead and talk now about 837 Revision 1, and um, it is the guide for applying the risk management framework to systems, um, to federal information systems, but it's pretty flexible and it can easily be applied to non-federal systems as well. So here we see this uh, list again that we saw earlier of the, the various uh, publications. I guess I put that in there as a review. Um, we've, we've seen this, we want to manage risk, we can't eliminate it, so we need to know about it and, and manage it. And uh, just a review of our, our tiers, and, and I have it made larger that we are living on, at the system level uh, for this, for the risk management framework. So, and you can see the book there is 837. But just as a reminder that, that we do have the three tiers um, and the information that we get by doing the risk management framework at the system level should be uh, should flow upward towards uh, the the uh, other tiers. So in this special pub 837 revision one, um, it is a holistic risk management process. It's not focused on compliance. It's not focused on any one step. All the six steps in the process work together. Um, and and all need to be done to uh, you know to, to have good risk management in place for your systems um, we do have the risk management framework steps integrated into the SDLC so and um, by the way the NIST special publication that goes over system development life cycle is NIST special pub 864 and so we define certain Steps. I mean, if you look at different system development life cycle uh, guidance, not, not just from NIST, but other, they, the steps can be named or the phases can be known by different names, but, but since we're NIST, of course, we use the steps that were defined in 864. And we, for each task in the, um, within each step of the risk management framework, it tells you which phase of the system development life cycle you should be in at that time. So if you're, it, you know, when we get further on in, into this, if, if you're in, uh, you know, step three, task four, then you should be also in this phase of, of the life cycle. So um, in most of the steps and, until we get up to authorize are done in the pre-operational phases of the system development life cycle. So. So anyway, uh, that's, that's how we integrate the risk management framework into the system development life cycle by, by telling you whatever step and task you're in, here's where you should be in the system development life cycle, or here's the phase of the system development life cycle that you should be in when you're doing the particular risk management framework task. Um, provides processes for each of the six steps, right? So similar to what we saw in 39 and 30, we have a step, then we have tasks under the step, and so pretty, pretty uh, standard format there. Okay, the purpose of, of 37 is to ensure that, man, uh, that risk is managed. Uh, the risk from operating information systems in order an organization needs to be managed and, and known about like we've talked about already. So um, we use the risk management framework to inform our senior leaders, um, ensure that any requirements, security requirements, and controls are integrated into enterprise architecture and uh, into the system development life cycle, like, like I've said. And of course, we want to support ongoing security authorization decisions. And, and so um, this is kind of a, in a it's a, a semi-new concept that we're trying to move forward rather than the, that static every three year process that we had been using. We want to move forward with that and evolve into an ongoing authorization where we're constantly aware, we have sort of constant, or I think uh, we call it near real-time risk management. So we have pretty darn current information at any given time, and we can use that information to, to use to, for ongoing authorizations uh, of our uh, systems instead of every three year static authorizations like we've had in the past. So, and that's a process, it's not something that today you're doing the three year static process and now tomorrow we're doing ongoing authorization. It's something that you have to work towards. There's a lot of processes to get put in place, a lot of tools to get put in place, but that is something we're all trying to work towards in the federal government and, and hopefully you can all work towards that as well at the state level. So we'll talk more about that. Um, and of course, you know, the, the ultimate goal is to achieve more secure information and information systems. So 
you know, but I think I mentioned that earlier, you know, I don't like to subscribe to we're doing this for compliance, we're doing it because we should be doing it and we need to protect our information and by, by doing that and going through the process and using it as it's intended, then compliance falls out of that automatically. So in my opinion, the focus should not ever be on compliance, but um, anyway, so that's the purpose. Uh, some characteristics of the risk management framework based process, uh, it establishes responsibility and accountability. So that's the other thing in, within each task, it says who's res whose responsibility is it to complete this task. And so it tells you right up front, you know, these are the people, this is the role that should probably be responsible for this. And then there's also supporting roles, so who might you also involve in this process. So we do go, go through that. Um, integrates information security more closely into the enterprise architecture and system development life cycle. We've talked about that. Puts equal emphasis on each of the six phases. So like I said, it's a holistic process. It starts, you start at the beginning and move through continuous monitoring through the whole life cycle. And again, there's no one, um, one step is no more important than another step. And the reason that this is, is brought up is because in the original version of 837, the focus was on authorization of the system and authorizing the system to operate. And so that became, and then it, it sort of became a compliance exercise because of that. Because FISMA tells us that all our systems have to be authorized, and so the, the goal seemed to just be authorization rather than security. And so with 37 Rev 1, we tried to move away from that. Um, and, and make it a more holistic process, a more comprehensive process, where the focus was on the on, on the entire process overall and on having secure systems uh, commensurate with risk and not just complying with uh, having the system authorized to operate. And of course, I, I mentioned near real-time risk management through the implementation of robust continuous monitoring. So monitoring is step six. And then when we get to that, we have a whole publication on continuous monitoring. And so we want to promote that idea of near time, uh, near real time risk management through continuous monitoring and then using that information that comes from as the output of the continuous monitoring process and feed that into the ongoing authorization. So we have a nice little circle of information happening there. And what else do we have here? Encourages the use of automation. So we do want to encourage automation to help us increase consistency and effectiveness. And I mean, if you have a big giant uh, um, you know, number of, of components in your system or a number of systems that you're dealing with that also have large numbers of components, I mean, you can't do configuration management manually to, to more than a couple of systems. I mean, it's just not possible in any kind of accurate way. So in, in with a lot of systems, you need automation to really you know, implement your security in a, in a manageable way. So we do want to encourage that. And, um, and then we want to provide those senior leaders with the information that they need to make the risk base. So we talked in 39 about how we need to have security from the uh, top down and how senior level managers need to take responsibility. But to do that, they need to have accurate information and, and information that is is uh, timely and, and current. And so um, we want to use this process to give them that information that they need so that, that they can actually make good decisions uh, using that information. Okay, system boundaries. So before we do anything, you know, we need to define what we have and what, what is the scope of, of the system that we're looking at. So remember, this uh, 37 lives at the system level. So uh, you need to know before you get started what your system boundaries are. Now, and there's guidance on system boundaries in Special Pub 818. Um, but you know, basically, you have a system owner, and you uh, you decide based on who is who has management responsibility, who has cost and budget responsibility, and then there's various criteria uh, defined in 818 of how you determine what your system boundaries are, or what information you need to help you determine those boundaries. But you need to know where your system that you're doing the risk management process on right now ends and, and another system begins. So it's very important to define those boundaries and what you're protecting and, and what else comes with that. You, you know, we t I had that Stephen Hawking quote, up. you need to know what you have. Um, not only do you need to know what your boundaries are, but you better have an assessment, um, sorry, a, um, an inventory of your assets that are part of that system. So 
it's important before you even start applying the risk management framework that you a know what your boundaries are and b know what is living within that boundary so um, what components do i have that make up the system and by components i mean hardware and software so you need to know all of that before you can really dig in and start doing the risk management framework so those are some some things you need to do beforehand um, right so establish that before you, you get started so i already said that does that make sense? Do we all have a, an accurate asset inventory of our systems? Do we know what components make up our systems? And, and that includes now we have to be concerned about virtual components. So if we have a bunch of virtual, virtual machines have configuration management issues and, and everything else just like other and can pose risks uh, in, in a lot of similar ways to, to the old fashioned hardware. So watch out for those and, and try, to, try to keep a grip on those. But anyway, um, roles and responsibilities. So here's some of the main roles that we have defined. There's a few others, but these are the main ones. You, you have your risk executive function that we already talked about. The authorizing official is the senior level management official who actually accepts the risk of operating the system or denies the authorization to operate. And uh, that person is one of the main ones who needs all of that current near real time risk management information. Um, we have the senior information security officer. That's usually um, someone who has, is someone usually living maybe maybe at tier one, maybe at tier two, and is, is sort of an organization-wide um, person responsible for security for the whole organization, not just at the system level. Uh, we have common control providers. So we talked a little bit about common controls earlier and we'll talk more about them later, but who's ever in charge of providing those common controls, whether they're common controls provided by systems or common controls provided by an entity like human resources or uh, your physical security staff or something like that, um, those, these people have roles to play in the risk management framework and so they need to be part of the process. Your information system owner, very important, the information system owner is responsible for the day-to-day -day operation and, and management of, of the system, including the security of it, of course. Uh, the information owner. So sometimes we have systems where, where our information is, is living on somebody else's system. So we own the information, but we don't control that system. So uh, we have information owners in, in those cases, and, and those information owners obviously need to coordinate with the, the actual system level people very closely because they know what the value of their information is. The information system security officer. So a lot of the real um, hard work in the trenches falls to the information system security officer. So that person is, is doing the day-to-day -day, um, actual looking at security at the system level and what's implemented, what needs to be changed, maybe, uh, maybe looking at log files, you know, it really depends. but. Um, usually they're helping or maybe even doing the system security plan and maintaining those sorts of things at, uh, for the system owner. And then we have security control assessors. And so these are the people who come in in step four, uh, the assess step, and, and assess the effectiveness of our controls that we've put in place. And they uh, maybe, if you have at least um, from a federal perspective, if you have uh, a low impact system, then the assessors can be within the system uh, staff. Your, your own system staff can, can go ahead and do an assessment if you have a low impact system. If you have a moderate or high impact system, then you need to look outside. You can have, um, I know at NIST we have a group that does all the assessments for all the systems uh, at NIST. And so they're, they're a separate entity. They don't have any systems of their own, but they go around and assess. Uh, all the other systems at NIST. Sometimes uh, other organizations might uh, use contractors to come in and do their assessments. So it ha has to be an independent assessment, not in the sort of chain of command of the system. So um, those are control assessors. And then there's a couple others like, um, like I don't know, security architect, information security architect, and things like that that we define in 37. But these are the main ones that we're going to see um, as we go through the steps. So the task uh, structure is similar to what we saw in, in uh, 39 and, and 30. We have a, a task section that uh, tells us what the task is that we are doing right now, who's primary responsibility for it, and what are the supporting roles. And then we have supplemental guidance and 
and uh, which SDL phase or SDLC phase we're in, and, and so on. We'll see that in a minute. There's the rest of it. Okay, here's an example, task 2-4. So we see that the task name is security plan approval. Oh, I have it here. And um, we see that the primary responsibility for security plan approval, so this is early in task, uh, in step two, um, where we're, we've done our security plan and we're ready to, to start, uh, and we've selected the controls and we've documented them in the security plan, we're ready to start implementing. But before we do that, we better check with the authorizing official and find out um, if, if this is going to be adequate for, for him or her to accept. So the uh, review and approval of the security plan, the primary responsibility, uh, falls to the authorizing official. And then we see those supporting roles. The authorizing official might want to check with the risk executive function, perhaps with the CIO, or perhaps with the um, senior information security officer. And the phase that we want this to be done in is during the development and acquisition phase if we're talking about a system that's under development and not an existing system. And then, of course, we see the supplemental guidance there. And then down at the bottom, uh, references that, that may help us. And, and so we can see that um, we might need a risk assessment to help us with this. And 53, certainly a giant part of the select step. And, uh, and CNSS instruction 1253 is for the DOD folks. That's their, that this, uh, the newest one is from March of 2012. And that is the one that uh, brings in the NIST uh, documents that, that they also worked on and had authorship of to the um, DOD process and the intelligence community process. So anyway, this is just an example. So you can see this is what every single task looks like as you move through 837. And so here's the whole uh, the six steps in the framework, which we saw a little bit earlier. So we start out with the categorized step, where that's where we identify what information are we processing, storing, or transmitting on the system. And, um, and then we, we give that an impact. We give each information type that we identify an impact level for confidentiality, integrity, and availability for all three. So you might have confidentiality of that is of a type of information, maybe that is going to be high impact, um, but maybe your availability is low. So then we always take the high watermark there, and, and then we would go with overall that information type would be high impact, even though availability impact might be low, um, or vice versa, or whatever. But anyway, so if you come out with 10 information types, you give every one of those information types a rating for C, I, and A. You take the high water mark of each of those, and then you take the high water mark of, of, of that. So if the highest um, impact rating of, of anything is moderate, then you're, you know, you're going to have a moderate impact system. Uh, but it's important to note what, what you did there because later when we start selecting controls and we start tailoring, then we might be able to say if there's a control that supports only availability, such as a lot of your contingency planning controls, and you have low availability, you can still go back and make a uh, and, and sort of a, do a low impact version of that control for availability because it's because your availability is still really low, actually. So so keep that in mind. Did that was that confusing? Is everybody okay? All right. So anyway, that's categorization. We're going to go into that a little bit more. We're going to go into each step a little bit more. But, um, anyway, then we move on. Once we know what our impacts are, we can now uh, do our select and select the controls that we're going to put in place to protect uh, that information at those uh, appropriate impact levels. And this is part of the security commensurate with risk. Because obviously, if we have a low impact system, we're not going to put a bunch of ultra high impact controls on there because that would be a waste of resources. And we all know that we help have scarce resources. So um, we go through the select step. We use FIPS 200 and, and Special Pub 853, and we'll go through a lot of that later, so I won't <laughs> talk about that. Then we go to step three, the implement step. So we know what controls we selected. Now we start cranking away and, and getting them implemented uh, in our system. And if that system is under development, then hopefully we have our developers uh, making sure that those controls are going to be uh, available within that system. And if it's a system that is already in existence, then we might have to double back and, and do some retrofitting or something like that. 
Um, but I have, you can see here, I, many special pubs, and, and I touched on this earlier uh, with, with when I said that we have over 160 special pubs out there, and I'll just read off some of the um, some of the technologies that we have publications on TLS, wireless, RFID, DNS, web servers, firewalls, encryption related products, voice over IP, Bluetooth, uh, just general servers, cell phones and PDAs, mobile, uh, mobile code, telecommunications, and, and so on and, and more. So if you're implementing any of those technologies as part of your system, you can go out, look at our publications and see if there's any information in there that can help you uh, implement those technologies in a more secure way. And then we also have operationally uh, process focused uh, pubs such as um, patch management, contingency planning, media sanitization, the SDLC, uh, security training, log management, password management, and many more. So again, you know, if you're trying to come up with a process for media sanitization, then please go out to, to, um, to csrc.nist.gov and find the pub on media sanitization and, and maybe that can help you. And so that's the implement step. And then we move on once everything's implemented, we're ready to go, we wanna go into operation, but now we better check first and see, do an assessment and see, are all of these th controls we implemented and we think we put them in place, are they really effective and operating as intended uh, with respect to providing security for the system? So we get to either an independent team or our own uh, system level team in there and we assess the controls following Special Pub 853A and um, then when we've done that and we have our security assessment report, then we go to our authorizing official and now he or she gets to check out all that information and determine if, uh, this, if he or she wants to uh, authorize the system to operate. And then once the system goes into operation, then that's when we start our continuous monitoring, which is step six. So don't worry, we're going to talk a lot more about all of these. So contain your excitement. Um, any questions? Yes, sir. Um, so, 853A, when does the next version come out? Oh, oh, don't I wish it was already out. Yeah, well, that gets back to scarce resources. But we are working on that actively, and we are going to have a draft out by the end of February <laughs> if it kills us. So, anyway, we apologize for not getting it out sooner. We had hoped to have it out within six months of, um, but actually we're going to be, well, be, well, no, it'll be more like ten months, so. I have a separate question. Okay. Um, are you going to be putting these out in Word doc format instead of PDFs? Because we like to really use some of those as templates, mm -hmm. but to recreate it takes a lot of time. I've done it a few times. So, so yes, um, we actually we put out um, the 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 short answer is yes. Um, there's been a big hue and cry for Word versions, and we were kind of you know worried about the security or you know people mutilating the document and you know but but now we've we've done a risk assessment and decided that uh, that it's actually better to, that the risk is low of that happening and we still have the authoritative source from from our website so and, and let that be a lesson to everyone go to the authoritative source to get the documents that you're looking for um, and in fact we I was doing we're I'm, we're also trying to get an XML uh, file put up for 853 Rep 4 and one of the things that we decided to do was in, in put uh, web links or, UR, or URLs in there and so some of the for, for the references for some of the references that we have and so I was just going through and trying to find the URLs and you know it's interesting how many non authoritative sources have you know uh, put copies of various uh, documents out there and as I was looking through that I thought no oh, this isn't quite right on some of these so uh, so anyway, watch out for that a little side issue, you know, try to try to go to the source um, when you're looking for your documents. But in any case, yes, we are going to put a Word document out. Um, and I just also recently posted for the contingency planning um, document, the, uh, the templates we have in the back, I posted them in Word so that if you want to use those templates that they're, they're out there in Word instead of in the PDF. But anything else? Okay. So, categorizing, I already said, we're, we're determining the criticality of the information and the system, and, and that's according to the potential worst case uh, scenario. Um, okay, coming right up. So, the tasks that we have here in, for the categorized step are the actual security categorization, um, categorizing the information system, 
and documenting the results, uh, doing an information system description as part of task one. So in your security plan, you, you want to describe the system. Um, you probably want to reference the uh, reference a um, diagram of some sort. And, and here's another thing to watch out for. When you're doing your uh, security plan, if you're, and actually I was going to talk about this. Actually, I'll wait. I'll wait and talk about it on the security plan slide. So anyway, put your description in there as part of uh, as task one two, and then and then re and we said we called it registration. And one reason for this is I don't know if you have this problem in the state of California, but certainly it, it, we have the problems in the federal government of you know people are just out there. Oh yeah, we need this system, and let's just you know they're they're basically just developing systems and putting them online without going through the risk management framework process or getting them authorized to operate. So. Um, one of the steps we put in here was, um, you can't do that. You need to register your system and tell someone and that you know that you that you uh, are standing up this system and that it's going to be operating on your network. And you can't uh, bypass the process. So that's why that's in there. Um, but anyway, and so then the publications that support this step, we have special publication 818 revision one, which is in desperate need of of a revision two, uh, which I hope to get to sometime soon. But in any case, it has guidance in it for developing system security plans, um, what the structure and content should be. There's a template in there. It's kind of not as robust as, it is, as I would like it to be in, in revision two. But um, the special publication 818 does support all steps in the risk management framework, but you do want to begin um, with that in step one or even before step one because, as I noted earlier, you, you already want to know what your boundaries are um, and things like that before you actually start the process. Uh, you, it is a living document and you should update it anytime changes are made. And this gets back to um, the three year static process. I mean, we would have people, they would do their security plan, they would get it approved and then they would just toss it aside and three years later they would pick it up again. Now what happened? What did we do two years ago? What did we do a year and a half ago? Who the heck knows? Who can remember that? You know, so it's important to keep keep it updated as you go along. And uh, and it's used to record information about your system. I mentioned the boundary diagram, um, information flows, your roles and responsibilities specific to the system, security control implementation details, and that's highlighted because that's one of the more important things in there. And uh, rationale and justification for risk-based decisions or scoping decisions or tailoring decisions. When we get to 53, we'll talk more about that. But whenever you make a decision like that, you want to document that in your security plan. And here's what I was starting to get at before. You Instead of, of repeating a bunch of information that you have that lives elsewhere in a process or a policy or um, you know in some other document or wherever, um, you can reference it, and that's a really good idea because you don't want to have the same information repeated in multiple places because then what happens? Something, one thing gets updated and the other things don't get updated. Or you forget that you put this information in three places and now you have to go back and update it in three places. So having just one place to uh, store any particular bit of information is, is a better idea and then you can reference it in your security plan where it is and where it's living, where it can be found. And I already told my Point Magoo story of how important it is to document decisions and, and things that, that happen. Um, that's not the only reason, but it's a good illustration. So that's the uh, system security plan. And then we have um, FIPS 199. And so if we recall from the very beginning, FIPS is a federal information processing standard, which is made mandatory for federal organizations by FISMA. And, um, and, this, and FISMA also defined our security objectives of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So that's again why we, we look at our, um, at our impact levels on, for each security objective. And then also it defines three impact levels, low, moderate, and high. Um, you, there's a little nice little table in there that's you know much more detailed than this, but a uh, low impact uh, problem would, would have a limited adverse impact, and moderate would be a serious adverse impact, and high would, would be a catastrophic, really nasty stuff. So, um, and then there's there's much more information that you can use to help you uh, determine what what impact you might have, and then. 
We also have NIST Special Publication 860, Revision 1, and I, we, we would like to also do a Revision 2 on that. But in any case, uh, again, we're supporting the categorized step, and there's two volumes here, and I made a mistake myself when I was at NIST on the operational side, and I dove right into Volume 2 of, um, of this uh, catalog of, of information types, and, and that uh, didn't, I didn't help myself out by doing that, because it can be a little confusing, so... If, I advise you, volume one is really thin, so take the time to, to go ahead and read the instructions first, and then, and then you can go on to volume two, which is a giant catalog of information types, and then it gives you a provisional impact rating, and you don't, it's provisional, so you don't have to adopt that rating. You can have some justification or reason why you're going to make it higher or lower than, than what 860 is, is suggesting in the provisional rating. So, and again, like I mentioned earlier, you, you inventory and categorize all your information types and apply the high watermark concept. So, and that's something, again, in the workshop, we're gonna, ba we're gonna basically be going through this entire process uh, from start to finish for a fake system. So, now we know, okay, let's just say we have a moderate impact system. So, we're ready to move on and select some controls. So, we move on to step two, the select step. And that's where we select our controls, uh, starting with the appropriate baseline using that categorization that we found out in step one. So if we have a moderate impact system that we found out in step one was moderate impact, then we start with the modern impact baseline that we define in, in Special Pub 853, which we're going to get to uh, later. So, um, But that's what you start with, that, that whatever baseline is appropriate. And so the steps for the select step, there they are. Um, common control identification. So before you do anything, before you start selecting controls yourself, why don't you see if there's some common controls that you can adopt instead and save yourself the drama of doing it yourself. Um, so you hopefully uh, your organization has available to you what common controls you can inherit from uh, another entity. So you're a uh, system owner and you're getting ready to stand up the system and you know your moderate impact and so you go to your organization's catalog of common controls that they provide or that are provided and you look through that and you see what can you inherit from there and apply that to your system without actually having to do any work other than determining if it's really appropriate for your system. So, because that's the other thing, every common control that's out there uh, that you're, that's available to you, it may not be appropriate. You know, maybe the common control is only provided at a moderate impact and you have a high impact system. So, uh, you can't just across the board say, uh, here's 20 common controls, slap them, you know, on and, and it's not that easy. You have to at least uh, give it a little bit of thought, are the common controls going to work for your system? But assuming they do, then, um, then now you know, I don't have to do these 20 controls because um, I'm already getting those provided to me. And you know, it can be controls like, do I have a slide on this? I don't want to get ahead of myself. I probably do later. Um, so I probably do in 853 section. But um, you know, you might have, you know, probably, I, I don't imagine, does the state of California have one big human resources? Department? No. Yes or no? Sorry. No. Yes, we have one. So yes and no. Yes and no. Okay. Each agency manages their own. Okay. Well, maybe. What's that? Each agency manages their own human resources, but there is a large agency that is human resources that they all work through. Okay, all right, so maybe that large organization puts out some policies. So when you get to the uh, personnel security family, you know, maybe you don't have to do any policies because you're just inheriting those policies, maybe from the upper level, maybe it is from your own uh, organizational level, you know, and maybe at your organizational level, maybe they're telling you, here's our termination procedures, here's our transfer procedures. So when you get to those controls in the PS family, you don't have to do that because you're going to follow their procedures anyway. And, and so, so that's one example on the process side. And then you might also have um, controls provided to you. Say, so say you have a team that is, is managing the firewalls and, and the routers and, you know, and, and let's, we'll just call that the network security system. 
And so there, there's a lot of controls that are provided by that. So if you're, you're just some financial system or something, you know, you're not going to provide your own firewalls and your own routers and all of that stuff. You're going to have, hopefully have a, more of a centralized office doing that for you that is, has expertise in that area. And so you're going to inherit uh, the controls like AC4 and SC7 from, from them. So those are examples, and, and I think we get more into that when we get to 53. But that's just some idea of common controls and, and where they might come from and, and how you can inherit them. And then we actually go in with, so whatever's left over now, we have to uh, implement ourselves at, at the, at the uh, system level. And so we go ahead and start selecting the rest of the controls um, based on our impact level that we determine in, under categorization and also using our risk assessment. And we might need to do some tailoring and we're gonna get into all that later. And then uh, we develop our monitoring strategy. So we said that monitoring was step six um, of the risk manager framework. So why are we developing a strategy for it here in step two? So, well, you know, the, obviously the reason is because you need to know what your monitoring strategy is going to be and what you might need to have in place quite early. So you don't want to get to the, um, the very end and you're ready to, you've, you've been authorized to operate and now you, you're like, oh, oh no, we need to do continuous monitoring, you know? So you need to already have that thought out and what you need to have in place uh, way at the beginning before you start implementing. So we, that's uh, developing your monitoring strategy is there in the select step as task two, three. And then um, that we saw this earlier as our example, we do the security plan approval. We've got our security plan all written up. We've put our uh, details in there, what controls we're gonna implement, how we're gonna implement them. And we go ahead and give that to the authorizing official so that that person can determine if, if this is gonna be adequate before we start spinning our wheels implementing things that, that maybe weren't or aren't. Okay. And um, so we have some pubs that help us with this step. And the first one is another FIPS, Federal Information Processing Standard 200. And uh, that defines our 17 security related families. You know, the access control family, the personal security family, the, you know, um, all of those families, the contingency planning family and so on, configuration management. Uh, we'll see a list of them when we get to 53. And anyway, so it defines, FIPS defines those families and it's, it specifies that, that we NIST had to define a minimum baseline in 53. And so that's why, that's where we see our low, moderate, and impact baselines in that publication. And it also specifies in FIPS 200 that the baselines uh, have to be able to be tailored. Or, so, you know, we'll get into that. But that's what FIPS 200 tells us. So 853 is a catalog of security controls. And we have, again, I, I don't want to keep saying this, but we have a whole s section on 53 coming up, but um, it is a catalog of security controls. And just like with any catalog, you don't buy everything in the catalog, and nor do you select every single control in 853. So again, you start with those baselines and then you do your tailoring. And the correct uh, the output should be the correct balance of security commensurate with risk. So you're going to maybe throw some controls out for whatever, for various reasons, and you might have to supplement and bring some other additional controls in or compensate also. And uh, we'll get into that. Uh, we do update Special Pub 853 every two to three years, and that drives a lot of people crazy, and including ourselves. But, um, you know, it's important that the controls stay current. And, and we, we really feel that we that Special Pub 8 on 53 really is the most comprehensive security control catalog uh, that's out there today. And, um, and we, we love it a lot. So uh, it does support step two of the risk management framework. It defines the baselines. Um, the initial very first version came out in 2005, and then now we're up to revision four um, that was published in, in April of this year. Security controls, I'm sure we all know, but just to make sure they are the safeguards and or, or countermeasures that we implement on our machines to uh, or on our systems to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the system and its information. 
And in 853, we define three types of, com of controls. We've already talked about the common controls, and then we have the system-specific controls, and then we might have um, hybrid controls. So if anyone's looked in 53, they know that a lot of the controls have more than one requirement in them, or in, in some cases, many requirements in, in a single control. So uh, it might be that some of those requirements are provided by some common provider and, and some aren't. And so that would make it a hybrid control because whatever's not implemented at the common level has to be implemented at the system level or scoped out of. But anyway, that, that's, those are the three types of controls that we, that we have or, and would document um, in our security plan. And by the way, you would document in your security plan if the control isn't. So if you have your moderate baseline and then for every control that's in there in your security plan, even if you're going to scope out of it or make a risk-based decision about it, you still have it in there and then you document what your risk-based decision is. And likewise, you document if it's a hybrid control and you document which part of that control is done by the common control provider and which part is done at the system level and how. Now, of course, the common part, you would just reference something else and not repeat all of that information. Uh, okay, the baselines in 53 are uh, defined in, in Appendix D, Table D2, and they're determined by the information system, information and system categorization that we found out about in step one and also feeding into that could be the organizational risk assessment and risk tolerance as well as your system level risk assessment so um, baselines can and should be tailored so if you're um, you know if you're not tailoring your baseline then you're just doing a checklist and um, maybe in some cases checklists have their place but overall um, Again, we want to put that thought into it. We don't just want to be automatons doing a checklist. So um, we want to make security commensurate with risk, and that's why some of the controls in the baseline may not be appropriate. Uh, others in the control catalog may be more appropriate, and so that's why we tailor our baseline. And then we also have parameters, and we'll see this when we get to 53, but uh, these are assignments and selections that are within the controls. Like A lot of them have to do with how frequently you're going to do something, or various implementation um, determinations that you can select those parameters. And then we have uh, the scoping and compensating, which again we'll talk about more later, and then supplementing is when um, you want to pull in new controls and to counter a specific threat or something like that. So why do we have all those controls uh, in 53 when, when you know we're not going to use them all maybe for, for a given system? And, and uh, so the reason is that we, we do want to have a, a comprehensive control set so that any threat that you're trying to counter, that there's some control available that you can find out about in 53, it, it's, you know, we hope that it's there. And so that's one reason. Um, and so those controls and enhancements that are not selected in, in your baselines are available for you to, to implement. And then the, the other reason that I, that I don't have on there is that... Um, when we uh, did our joint task force with DOD, they needed a lot of controls uh, above and beyond what civilian organizations need, need to ever do and, and above and beyond the high baseline. So a lot of the controls have been added in there um, because DOD and the intelligence community needed them. But it's good because it's made the catalog much more comprehensive. Um, so a lot of those controls in there, you might see them if you're a DOD and you go to look and see an SSI uh, 1253. And they're doing a whole set of uh, overlays, and we'll talk about overlays later, but uh, for, for various DOD systems. Uh, let's see, did I miss anything? I think we've been over all that. So, so now we know what our selection is going to be. We have it all down in our security plan, and now we move on to step three, where we're going to implement our controls. And so this is where we do that. And of course, we use sound systems engineering practices and apply security configuration settings. So we have only two tasks there, um, implement those controls and document that implementation. So pretty straightforward. It's actually probably the hardest step, but um, it seems like the easiest from the tasks. So let's see, we have, there's a couple of, um, hubs I wanted to call out 
that help us with our implementation. And in specifically, uh, we have my personal favorite, since I had primary authorship of it, Special Pub 800-128, Security Focus Configuration Management. And we have a configuration management family. That's one of the 17 families. If you go through 800-128 and follow the guidance in there, then you are done. You're all done with the con uh, configuration management family. So uh, it does provide implementation guidance for that family. And, it, and you might recognize these phases, starting with planning, um, identifying and implementing configurations, controlling change to those configurations, and then guess what the last one is? Big shock there, monitoring. So, and again, we don't monitor that separately in a separate configuration management monitoring program. It's part of our overall monitoring program. So, I encourage you all if you're working on security focused configuration, and of course, configuration management is something that's been around forever. It just doesn't necessarily have a security focus or even consider security in some cases. So, what we've done with 128 is fold security into an already existing configuration management, more of a, it, as it was without security, it's more of a functionally based uh, process. And so, we folded security into that um, in 128. And then we also have another family covered by Special Publication 834, Contingency Planning uh, Guidance. And so, if you again, if you go through 834 and follow the guidance in there, you're all done with the Contingency Planning family. So, it, uh, you go through and you do a business impact analysis, which you should all hopefully do anyway. And then in 34, we identify three phases for contingency planning and disaster recovery, the activation phase, the recovery phase, and the reconstitution phase. We identify roles and responsibilities. We have uh, appendices that you should put in your contingency plans. And then we do have those templates uh, that I just mentioned have recently been put out in Word format so that you can take them and, and uh, modify them as you need. And then thirdly, we have, and I bring these up because they cover a whole family, and that, that's why I, I call these out separately. But we also have an incident response family, and so we have NIST Special Pub 861, Revision 2, Computer Security Incident Handling Guide, and that goes through, guess what, four phases. Oh, imagine that. Preparation, uh, detection and analysis, containment, eradication, and recovery, and post-incident activity. Uh, so, it, again, if, if you go through 861 and you develop the, the plans and processes that they, that they discuss in there, then um, you're pretty much finished with your IR family. So there's three families done, just like that. Uh, three down, 14 more to go. Okay. So, and then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, we have all those other pubs I read out the list uh, that you can look at. Um, and that might help you as you implement. Okay, so step four, assess. So we've got everything implemented, we're ready to go, we're ready to go operational, but we can't quite do that yet because we haven't assessed whether or not those controls are operating effectively like we intended. So um, are, are they meeting the security requirements uh, for the system? So here's our steps for assessment, for the assess step or our task, I should say, task uh, 4-1, assessment preparation, and this is when the uh, security assessment plan is determined. And, and when we get to uh, the workshop, we'll see that that is maybe a lot more difficult than it sounds. Um, because if you have a system like the fake system that we're doing in the workshop, there's a lot of different uh, moving parts, there's a lot of different types of components and, and most, a lot of systems do have different types of components and when not only, and that's something I actually could have mentioned in the implement step as well, when you're selecting and implementing controls and assessing them, it, it might be different uh, if you've got Unix-based systems or Windows-based systems, if you've got uh, systems, if you've got servers and routers and workstations and, you know, um, mobile devices, whatever. You might have to implement things differently, you might have to select different controls, and then you're going to have to do different types of assessments. So there's a lot of things to consider to really get it right and do a really comprehensive job. Um, so anyway, part of developing your assessment plan is, is how are you going to deal with all the different types of, of platforms and, and components that might be part of, a, of any given system. 
Um, then you actually go in once you have your plan, what you're going to do. And, and also with that, I mentioned earlier how we have the three um, types, uh, interview, uh, examine, and test. So you'll also in your plan define what of the, which ones of those or all three or which combination thereof are you going to do uh, for each test or for each uh, control. And then once you know that and you've got your plan, then you go ahead and do the, the control assessment. And the output from that is the security assessment report. And that's where you document any findings that you had. So you found that, you know, uh, whatever control CM2, not doing not too good. You know, there's some problems here. We have some deficiencies. We have some vulnerabilities. So we document that in our security assessment report. We, we state what we think uh, the impact of that problem might be for the system and organization. And then, um, and then we talk that over with the system staff and we might be able to get some immediate remediations going. So there might be some quick uh, and easy low hanging fruit type of fixes that we can go ahead and do before we send that report on to our uh, authorizing official. And the publication that we use to do our assessments is 53A, which we just noted right now at this moment is not up to date with uh, 53 Ref 4. And uh, as we can see here, 53A is a companion document to 853. So every control and control enhancement that we see in 53 has a corresponding assessment procedure in 53A. So they're not the same, but they're companions, and that's why we didn't want to give the assessment guide a separate number. So you, know, you may or may not agree with that decision, but that's what we went with. Uh, anyway, it's a companion, and we will be updating it very soon. It does describe the high-level procedures for assessing the controls, and it provides assessment objectives, methods, and objects. It talks all about that. Um, so uh, the assessment steps, uh, again, planning always first and uh, determining which controls you're going to be assessing, if not all, um, selecting the appropriate procedures, tailoring, and finalizing the plan and obtaining approval. So if you're an assessor and you're coming in there, uh, you want to make sure you get that approved by the authorizing official, just like the security plan was approved. So make sure that the authorizing official is okay with what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And then you conduct that assessment and then um, analyze the results and then you make your recommendations and put that in the security assessment report. So really quickly, assessment objectives. Those are the determination statements and we're going to see what that looks like in, on the next slide. Um, Assessment methods are going to vary, like I just mentioned, with assessment objects. If your assessment object is a server, your assessment methods are going to be different than if your assessment object is a, an application or even a, a workstation or a router or whatever. Um, there we see our three assessment methods that I've already mentioned and what their objects might be. Interviewing, you're obviously going to interview um, individuals or groups of individuals and uh, you're going to examine some things and again in your security assessment plan you identify what you plan to examine and in 53a there are some ideas in there of what you might examine for a given control but anyway some things you might examine you can see their specifications various documents policies designs you might examine your mechanisms and uh, functionalities in your hardware software and firmware and you might examine activities what, what people are doing um, what's going on with operations, what the administrative staff is doing, what the management staff is doing, and so on. And then you have test, and those objects are actually mechanisms that you're going to go in and hammer on them and see, is, is it really working? Okay, and here's what the uh, assessment procedures look like. So we have the control, which control it is, uh, CM5 access restrictions for change. And uh, we see that the assessment objective is to determine if the organization basically does the things that it says to do in CM5. I won't read it out to you. And then you can see that it gives you some potential assessment methods and objects. So it says if you're going to examine something, here are some things uh, that you might look at examining with respect to CM5. Here are some people that you might want to interview. 
And you can see it's pretty high level. It's not too specific, but it still gives you some ideas and gets you started. So you're not just out there thinking of everything from scratch. And then uh, here's some things you might want to test. So that's how every single uh, procedure looks like throughout 53A. And, and I would really, in this case where it says, just in this particular one as an example, it says determine if the organization defines, documents, approves, and enforces. That's four things right there. So if I'm the assessor, I need to determine, did they define it? Yes or no. Did they document it? Yes or no? And so on. So, you know, that, that's the kind of thing you need to think about. Okay, so once we've done all that and we've got our security assessment report and we've, um, we're ready to give that to the authorizing official and see what that person thinks um, about it. And so the authorizing official either accepts the risk uh, to organizational operations and assets, individuals, other organizations, and the nation, um, and authorizes it to operate the system, or they deny it. And that, that's really the only two choices. And in fact, if the authorizing official wants some other uh, controls put in place first, in effect, they're still denying operation until those controls are put in place. So. And then uh, if that's what happened, then the assessor would come back in, assess the new controls that were put in place, add that to the assessment report, feed that back to the authorizing official, and then at that time, hopefully, uh, they would go ahead and authorize it to operate. So uh, step five steps, the um, authorized steps. Um, we have the plan of action and milestones. So um, we prepare that and we try to decide what, um, what of the findings we're going to mitigate. And whatever those findings are, we put them in the plan of action and milestones so we can show the authorizing official we, we recognize this as a problem, but we have this plan. And in the plan of action and milestones, you determine um, or you state what the resources are that you're going to use to uh, to do the mitigation. Um, you have milestones and dates. We're going to do this by this date, that by this other date, and so on. And the final, it's all going to be finished by another final completion date. And uh, you submit that along with the, uh, as part of the security authorization package. And you give that to the authorizing official. The security authorization package is this, basically the system security plan, the security assessment report, and that plan of action and milestones. So if we're looking at ongoing authorization, then this would be something that the authorizing official should be able to get this information by pulling it up on some sort of a dashboard type uh, display of report of some kind. And then that is when the authorizing official makes the risk determination. So the authorizing official looks at all of that and decides, um, can I accept this risk? Can I sign on this dotted line or, or not? And, um, and then they either do or don't. So with authorization, we have a couple of, of approaches that we can take. And um, we have the traditional authorization where a single authorization official accepts risk. We have the joint authorization where we might have, um, when we talked earlier about sharing risk, and some of you were a little uh, skeptical of how that would work. And, and likewise, it can be scary if you're having joint authorization where you have multiple authorizing officials accepting the risk. And again, this is a situation where if you're going to do that, you would want roles and responsibilities uh, well defined, but you can um, do a joint authorization. Again, you do need that close collaboration throughout all steps of the risk management framework. And you obviously you have to have some reciprocal trust in the other organization. It's just not going to work otherwise. So maybe it would never work. I don't know. But uh, it, it's out there. It's available for you to consider that. And then we have the leveraged uh, authorization. And, and that's basically reuse of, of authorization results. And I mentioned earlier about how we, we wanted to um, we wanted everyone to be using the same process so that we know, you know, we're not comparing apples and oranges, we're comparing apples to apples. So when, when we share our authorization results and 
reuse them from somebody else's authorization, we can feel at least somewhat secure that they've gone through the same process. They did the, uh, the assessing and the, using the same methods that, that anyone else would use. And the best example of this that we have today is, is, is the FedRAMP example where uh, this is for cloud. Has anyone heard of FedRAMP? I know Patrick has. Um, right, so we've got uh, uh, a federal, the General Services Administration managing this uh, contract vehicle whereby cloud service providers can apply to become a cloud service provider for the federal government. And then we have um, third party assessment organizations that we've approved that go in and do the independent assessment on those cloud service providers. They create a, um, a secure, an assessment report, and then that report is looked at by what's called, they made a joint authorization board, which is comprised of, I think, DOD, someone from DOD, and someone from GSA, and I'm not sure, somebody, there's three entities on the, the joint authorization board, or the JAB. And um, so then the JAB gives a provisional authorization. And so then, um, if you're, you know, whoever, the Department of Treasury, and you come along, and or even the state of California, you can see which uh, cloud service providers have the provisional authorizations, and then you can get with them and reuse those results. So they show you, here's our assessment information, this is what the JAB provisionally approved, and so you reuse those results. And so the idea is that we would have a, a number of federal entities you know, purchasing cloud services from a given provider, and instead of everyone going through the same process over and over, we've gone through it one time and we reuse those results. So, those are the three authorization approaches. And so, moving on from that, now we're all ready, we're authorized to operate, we start operating our system, and now what? Things start changing right away. Who has a system that never changes? Um, Probably not very many. Someone does? One oh, more you slide, do? Please. What? One more slide. I'm sorry about that. There you go. Right. So we start uh, monitoring, and uh, we want we call it continuous monitoring, and that's a slight misnomer in that it's not continuous in the sense of physics, you know, continuous, but it, but it is in in a in some sort of a discreetly defined time frame that is not every three years. Um, Except maybe maybe a few controls are, but but basically um, we're going to talk a little bit more about about it coming up. So I'll talk more about continuous. But anyway, um, you incorporate all the monitoring. I've mentioned this already. Anytime we've seen monitoring, you know, we want all of this incorporated into your continuous monitoring program. So your risk management uh, monitoring, your risk assessment monitoring, uh, your configuration management monitoring, and uh, your control effectiveness monitoring, all of that monitoring we hope you can incorporate into one big monitoring program. So the steps for monitoring in step in a, sorry, the tasks for step six are we start out with information system and environmental changes. We want to be looking at those, what's changing, um, do uh, impact assessments, on those changes because that's where you're going to start ending up with problems and, and uh, control implementations changing and, and becoming ineffective. Uh, we do our ongoing security control assessments. Um, actually, and this is something, so we, we have this subset language in there now and when we did 37, that, that seemed to be okay, but when we, when we did the continuous monitoring publication 137, we realized that really wasn't going to work in the context of continuous monitoring, so we're actually going to do a sort of a mini update of, of 37 uh, Rev 1 and, and take the subset language out of there and, and also remove, um, I thought I had this on a slide later, but we're going to remove the uh, Appendix G, which is the continuous monitoring section in 37 because now we have a whole pub on continuous monitoring and so there's only not it's not a giant conflict but right now there's it's they're slightly inconsistent with each other and so we want to use when we want people to use 137 so um so for now ignore uh this uh where's the subset ignore the subset language um because basically you're going to be for ongoing security control assessments you're going to be doing ongoing assessments of all the controls it's just going to depend how frequently you're going to do them that's that's the difference so we'll talk more about that in a few slides 
Um, then you're going to determine your ongoing remediation action. So we talked about the plan of action and milestones and, and how are you going to, um, to mitigate and, or possibly even accept the risk of, of what you find as you go on with your ongoing uh, assessments. And then, of course, you update as you go along the key documents that were part of the, um, the um, security authorization package. So you keep those updated. And again, then when you're in ongoing assessment, your authorizing official can just pull up a dashboard report and all the information is, is contained in there and can be pulled into a report that he or she can look at at any given time and get the most current uh, near real-time risk management information that's available by keeping those updated. So there's more uh, security status reporting. So whatever the status is, you find a way to report that and that's kind of what I was just talking about. Maybe it's through some sort of a dashboard report mechanism where, where uh, the, the senior officials or whoever needs to know can go ahead and pull that information up or maybe if you're not there yet, then you uh, periodically provide some sort of a report to them. And uh, then you have ongoing risk determination and acceptance. So as you do that reporting, if things have changed and now risk isn't acceptable anymore, then, you know, we have had at NIST one system that got uh, pulled. The authorization to operate got pulled. And uh, it had so many problems. It was a web application with a lot of cross-site scripting problems, and it was pretty ugly. And uh, it got pulled from operation for about six months before that could be resolved. So sometimes things like that happen and, and you know, that means the process is working in a way. So, um, so that's the ongoing risk determination and acceptance part. And then we have at the very end of our life cycle, uh, the system removal and decommissioning. So we don't just chuck this stuff out in the trash. We have to sanitize our drives and, um, you know, make sure there's nothing still stored in memory and all of those sorts of things and, and dispose of, of the uh, assets appropriately. So that is step six. A little bit about ongoing authorization. I've touched on it already. So um, your security program and, and monitoring program should be mature before you attempt ongoing authorization. So I mentioned that a little bit earlier. It was, it's not something that overnight you just jump from one to another. It's something you, you have to plan for and I think sort of slide into gradually. I really think that's probably the best way to do it. Um, and in fact, um, we, the, the program that DHS is doing, the Continuous Diagnostics and Monitoring or Mitigation Program, they're doing just that. They're starting with sort of the easy stuff, stuff that there's a lot of tools already available for, you know, patch management, uh, asset discovery, configuration management. There's tons of tools out there already available for that. So their first phase is starting with that and reporting on the uh, defects and um, problems that, uh, associated with, with those types of controls that, um, that already have mature tools available. Then as time moves on, they're gonna add in more, more things until eventually everything uh, is covered. So the whole comprehensive set of controls um, are gonna be covered on it for the uh, ongoing basis. And, and can be used for ongoing authorization. So, you know, it's something that takes a lot of planning and, and a lot of, um, of work. So, so, but it's something, again, we all wanna to work towards it. And uh, so when, once you get there, then you leverage the security information, the security related information that you're gathering uh, during monitoring to support the ongoing authorization. So all of that information you're getting um, from your monitoring program, the, that's what the authorization of the authorizing official is using now. To, um, to support ongoing authorization. So again, it, the, the information should be current. Um, and you gather the information with the frequency needed to support ongoing authorization. And we're gonna talk about frequencies uh, coming up on the next couple of slides. Um, let's see here, security related information, supporting ongoing authorization should be made available, obviously. And I talk about that as a dashboard type of thing. And then uh, any security related information from procedural or manual um, monitoring can also be, can be used as well for ongoing authorization. So let's talk about monitoring, Special Publication 800137. Um, so this is another one of my pubs. 
and uh, it does support risk management framework step six and it's management level guidance on implementing and developing a information security continuous monitoring strategy and program. Now, we call it information security and, con and continuous monitoring, or ISCM, because CM is also configuration management. And that's pretty ugly because configuration management is tightly coupled to continuous monitoring, so it's even difficult to try to use context to, to know which CM you're talking about. So watch out for that in, because I, I was unsuccessful in, in, in a lot of people are just calling it CM. I wanted to call it Como, um, but nobody liked that, so I was overruled. And uh, so we went with ISCM, but most people aren't using that. And so you see it in a lot of other federal documents in particular as just CM. So just make sure you know what's being talked about. But in any case, throughout 137, we call it ISCM. And as you can see, the definition there is maintaining ongoing awareness of information security, vulnerabilities, and threats in support of organizational risk management decisions. So um, it's keeping an eye on all of those things. And that's what that's the information you need to support those decisions. So the terms continuous and ongoing in this context mean that the controls um, and organizational risk are assessed, analyzed, and reported at a frequency sufficient to support the risk-based decision making that's needed to be done. And so in 37, we give you some criteria how you can make those determinations. So here are the process steps for ISCM in 800-137. So not surprisingly, um, we start out with the strategy, defining the strategy, which is basically a plan. And uh, if you'll recall, we did this in way back in the select step, in step two. Um, that's where we defined our strategy, what it was gonna be. Then you establish your continuous monitoring program. And the three moving parts for that are determining metrics, determining your monitoring frequencies, and uh, developing your uh, ISCM architecture, which is probably the hardest part. And right now today, it'd be kind of difficult to get an ISCM architecture that really covered every single control in, in an automated fashion anyway, but you can still get some architecture in place. And we do have, uh, we have some actually some NIST IRs uh, to help us with a it's called uh, CSERS, don't ask me, that's an acronym, and I cannot remember what it stands for, but if you go out to NIST and search NIST IRs and you look up CSERS, then you can see a notional architecture that, that may or may not help you, um, but it's out there. And uh, anyway, so that's step two. Then, of course, you implement the program, and that's when you start, then here comes all this data coming at you. You've deployed all your sensors, you're gathering the security-related information, and uh, maybe, maybe you're even throwing in some manually gathered information in there. And uh, now you don't just let it sit in a big giant database, you have to do something with it. And so you want to start analyzing it and reporting findings. And, um, and then with that, after we uh, have analyzed it, then we need to take some action probably, or at least um, annotate that we know about this problem and so that gets into our risk assessment type reporting or and deciding what our response is going to be uh, so we respond with mitigation actions or the other uh, choices that we have accepting transferring or rejecting um, and then of course you review and update the monitoring strategy so things change with your strategy too and especially at first You've gone in, you've done your strategy, you've done, you've, you've implemented your program, you determined your frequencies, and now you're finding out six months down the road that you need to tweak that a little bit, that you're, some, some things you're monitoring too frequently, some things you may be monitoring not frequently enough, they turn out to be more problematic uh, on an ongoing basis than you thought. And so you always go back and tweak that, um, what you determined earlier, and, and make sure that it, the, the strategy is still working for you. So I've talked a lot about the frequency determinations. And so this is just a short list. Um, and of course, in 137, there's a lot more detail uh, for each of these uh, criteria that you can look at. So the biggest one is control volatility. How often are things going to change with this control? So if it's something like related to configuration management or account management, these are changing daily. You know, we're having daily changes here. So. Um, you, you know, those are the types of things that you want to look at pretty frequently, maybe daily, maybe weekly, you know, I would say monthly at a minimum. 
Um, so that is a, a giant part of it. Your system categorization and impact level, of course, if you have a low impact system, you're monitoring things less frequently. Again, you don't want to waste the resources. It's low impact, so maybe we're going to you know, take that into consideration. Monitor a little less frequently if it's low impact, more frequently as you go up the line. Um, your control assessment object, controls and assessment objects providing critical functions. So this is another thing. If you've got your firewalls out there, you know, that, that's critical. And, you, you know, you want to monitor them and things, the controls associated with them probably more frequently than you do, you know, a workstation on somebody's desk. So you take that into account. Um, what about controls with identified weaknesses? So we just went through our process. Uh, our assessment process before we started operations and um, we found out that we have some weaknesses here and we've documented them we might want to be taking a look at controls associated with them more frequently to make sure that problems aren't happening uh, because uh, maybe we decided to accept that weakness or maybe we it's going to take us a year and a half to get mitigations in place so we want to keep a close eye on those types of things uh, your organizational risk tolerance uh, similar to impact in a way, but if you're again, if, if your organization is 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 risk tolerant, then you can maybe monitor things less frequently, and if they're risk averse, then more frequently. Your threat information, your vulnerability information, uh, these can these types of things can cause you to maybe just look at certain controls more frequently uh, that you know where the certain threat is targeted or a control that uh, mitigates a specific threat or vulnerability. Um, your risk assessment results. Um, can guide you in, in um, how frequently you're going to monitor and the output of your monitoring strategy reviews. Like I said, you're going to be getting all this data and then you, you say you were monitoring something weekly and it turns out it's pretty stable. You thought it was going to be a big giant mess and it turns out there's not much happening here. We're not actually having the volatility we thought we were going to have. So let's back off on that and try it monthly or bi-weekly or something like that and vice versa. Uh, you might find that something you thought was a done deal, this is a smooth, uh, mature process, we don't need to look at this that often, and you start finding out when you do get an assessment of it um, that it's a giant mess and you need to start looking at it more frequently. And then of course, um, I hate to bring in compliance, but you might have reporting requirements that, that uh, force you to look at something uh, with a certain frequency because you have to report on it you know, monthly or whatever. So these are the things that, that help you determine what your frequencies of monitoring are going to be. And uh, you know, initially when you go through and you're making these determinations, it's going to be a lot of work. But then uh, as time goes on, you know, you know, the process will smooth out and everything will be fine. So I just want to mention the need for caution with automation. We're all big fans of automation. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of things you can't even do without automating it, you know, depending if you have a large system. But um, don't let your automated tools lead you into a false sense of security um, because they might not provide a complete picture of the overall security posture. Um, watch out for, even watch out for things like uh, risk scoring, and I'm not against risk scoring, but you have to know what the scope of it is. So um, if you're taking a risk score, what is it really, what has that risk score looked at? You know, what has it looked at every platform? Has it looked at every uh, component? I don't know, but if it does, great. If it has, wonderful. That's excellent. But if, you know, you need to be aware of that um, when you're, when you're, uh, when you're looking at these, these types of, of scores or or the output from automated products so um, and of course your automated tools are no good to you if they haven't been installed and configured correctly and they don't have uh, uh, skilled people that are that know how to maintain them and, and take the information uh, from them so so these are all problems that could happen and, and also you know who's heard of Bruce Schneier couple of you. So, I mean, he can be a controversial figure, but one statement that he made that I think it would be hard to find anyone that to argue with is, I think it's something along the lines of, if you, if you think technology will solve all your security problems, you don't understand technology and you don't understand security. So, um, so it's not a silver bullet. There's no silver bullets. So don't think because I installed, you know, whatever tool, um, all my security problems are solved. Um, so just keep that in mind. I'm not being negative about automation at all, but I just want people to be realistic about it 
And, uh, and I also want to mention that some of the more ugly recent incidents that we've seen in the news, um, Stuxnet a couple of years ago, and of course recently we've had WikiLeaks and our friend uh, Edward Snowden, and those were not, automated tools could not help us there. So, um, you know, those were all incidences that happened from process failures. So, uh, just a little, just a word of caution, friendly word of caution there. Um, don't forget about your manual processes. So, let's see here. Okay, here are the supporting appendices that we see in 37 Revision 1. Again, references glossary acronyms like usual. Uh, roles and responsibilities, summaries, and then, oh, here's, I knew I had something on this. So we, this is Appendix G, and we are going to be removing that, so just ignore that right now. And then we have some operational scenarios and a little uh, appendix on controls and, and external environments. So um, if you're dealing with external environments that you don't control, there's some hints in that appendix on, on what you can do with that. Hmm. And that's it for the risk management framework.